Across a meadow ran a single motorad. There, nothing could be seen but the moderately wet earth, the grass, across which winter was slowly beginning to spread, the sky, the clouds, and the sun. There were no mountains in the distance, and the grass circled around from all sides. 90% of one's vision would be occupied by the sky. The motorad was packed full of travel luggage. On top of the rear pipe carrier sat a large briefcase, above which several containers of water and fuel were lined up. On each side of the rear wheel was a box, and a large rolled up sleeping bag was tied to the headlight. This is so boring, said the motorad. That's the 184th time, the rider said, and they both fell silent. The rider wore a brown coat, the excess hem of which was rolled up to her thighs. She wore a brimmed hat with long flaps that covered her ears, as well as a pair of goggles. The face behind those goggles was young. The girl seemed to be in her teens. She had large eyes and wore an intrepid expression across her face. There wasn't anything like a path across the grassy field, so, whilst running along the grass, avoiding the occasional bump, the motorad casually continued along. Eventually, the sun rose so high that the motorad's shadow extended completely horizontal to it. Are we taking a break anytime soon, Kino? The motorad asked. Well, the rider named Kino spoke. Not yet, but maybe we can stop early and take it easy this evening. Roger that, but even so, this is boring. 185, said Kino, then asked with a careful tone, Do you really get bored even when we're moving? The motorad called Hermes replied, That's right, especially when it's like this, where the land is so flat and we're going the same speed. It's as if I'm on a factory roller, and it feels though only my wheels are moving. I see. What about you, Kino? Doesn't it get tiring? Whether it's tiring or not, I think about other things while riding. Oh? Like what type of things? Kino said that it probably wouldn't be that interesting, but Hermes pressed on. Well, just now I was thinking, if I were having a knife thrust at me from the right, and I hit the attacker's hand to drop his weapon, do I make a shoulder throw, or do I twist his hand back and pin it down? Or should I take one step back and kick his hand? Or is it better to dodge the thrust with half of my body whilst going in for an elbow strike? Hermes remained silent. Those sort of things. That's not interesting. I told you. The motorad continued to run across the meadow. So boring. And that's 186. Kino stopped in the middle of her sentence. She stood up whilst riding. What's wrong? Asked Hermes. That's a surprise. What? From her distance, Kino spotted what looked like little specks of trash. When they advanced further, they became several small black dots in the green space below the horizon. As she gradually came closer, she realized that some of the dots were big, whilst others were tiny. Before long, Kino realized that the larger dots were dome-shaped tents, several of which were constructed close together. The small things around them were groups of livestock, and the people next to them. That is surprising. There are people here, and cows and horses and sheep. This isn't a country, is it? I can't believe there are people living out here. That's amazing, isn't it, Kino? Kino slowed Hermes down a little, and a person on a horse turned toward them and rode over. It was a young man in his prime, wearing peculiar clothing. What do you think, Kino? If they don't welcome us, we'll take a detour. But I'll talk to him first. Kino stopped Hermes, and the man came over. With a smile, he said, Hello, traveler. We are a clan living in these meadows. Kino returned the greeting, and the man asked her where she was heading. A country to the west. I have no intention to get in the way of your lifestyle. I'm just passing through. The man shook his head. There's no need for that. For generations, it's been our tradition to welcome any traveler that we meet. We'll share with you our food and dwellings. By all means, please, become our guest. Kino asked Hermes what to do. I don't mind as long as you're fine with it. After pondering for a moment, Kino spoke to the man. Then I would like that. Thank you. With a happy expression on his face, he exclaimed, Then please, follow me. He rode his horse toward the settlement. Kino launched Hermes and slowly followed. In the settlement, there stood approximately 20 portable tents. 
Heavy cloth covered the large dome-shaped objects, and one huge tent stood out from all the rest. An uncountable number of cows and sheep casually chewed on the grass in the area near the settlement. Men riding on horses were shepherding the flocks around. A group of about 20 people awaited Kino and Hermes, all of varying age. About half of them had pipes stuffed in their mouths from which smoke was coming out. Before the group, Kino cut Hermes' engine and got off. Then she removed her hat and goggles. Hello everyone, my name is Kino and this is my partner, Hermes. Hello there. The oldest looking man in the crowd with a pipe in his mouth spoke. Mr. Kino, Mr. Hermes, welcome. I am the chief of this family. Since we are constantly relocating, it is quite rare for us to meet a traveler. Please, do relax and rest your tired body with us. After Kino thanked him, a kind-looking middle-aged woman led her to one of the tents. Along the way, children could be seen peeking out timidly from several tents. The tent's interior was so spacious that it seemed like several people could sleep inside all at once. Wooden frames radiating outward from a central wooden pillar supported the roof. Soft felt was laid out underfoot. The entrance was made larger for Hermes so he could enter. When Kino heard that this tent normally served as the woman's house, but was made into her personal quarters for a while, she voiced her thanks once more. After the woman left, Kino removed her coat. She was wearing a black jacket underneath, with a belt strapped around her waist. Attached to the belt were several pouches, and on her right thigh hung a revolver-type hand persuader. Behind her hung another weapon, a 22 caliber automatic. Kino called the revolver cannon, and the other woodsman. Removing woodsman from its holster, Kino toppled over, face up inside the tent. <sighs> this is comfortable. She muttered instinctively. It is, agreed Hermes. If you think about it, this tent seems like it would be warm in the winter and cold during the summer. See, the hands are open. It must be so that it can be put together and taken down quickly. In order to search for pasture, they must have to relocate plenty of times each year. The chances of us meeting like this may be miraculous. Have they been living here in this meadow, existing side by side with earth and nature their whole lives? And with no high protective wall to surround them? Are you jealous? I'll bet they'll be your friends if you ask. Kino got up and spoke. No, I'll pass. I doubt I'd fit in here. Well, where would you fit in, Kino? In the evening, Kino was invited to supper. Since Hermes was asleep, Kino left him inside the tent and was introduced to everyone in front of the large tent which belonged to the chief. The entire clan consisted of a little less than 50 people. There were about 10 children who are no more than 12 years old. After that, she was treated to a meal in the chief's tent. Lined up on a low and long table was a simple and frugal meal, most of which were made up from dairy products. When Kino asked if the food was suited to her tastes, she honestly replied that it was delicious. However, because of the incessant smoking of the pipes, the inside of the tent was considerably filled with smoke. Kino's eyes began to sting, and she asked for permission to leave. You. Kino, startled, turned toward the voice's origin. A man who appeared to be in his thirties stood. Although he was wearing the same clothes as the rest, his eyes were a different color, a light shade of gray. The color of his skin was also somewhat different, and he was noticeably taller than the others. Don't mind me, he said to Kino. He continued to stare at her, fixed with his gray eyes, and asked in a flat tone, Are you the traveler who came today? That's right, Kino said. Everyone thinks you're a man, but you're not. Are you? What about it? Kino returned. Nothing. He looked at Kino a while longer, and then left, without going into the tent.
The next day, Kino woke up at dawn like usual. When she went outside, everyone was already awake and milling around with their daily activities. A woman was milking a sheep, a young man was grooming a horse, and the children were helping to light a fire. Occasionally, an adult would come over to light their pipe. When a woman who happened to pass by told Kino that it was fine for her to sleep a little longer, Kino replied that she was accustomed to waking up early. The woman smiled and said, That is a very good thing. After everyone had finished their tasks, they gathered in small groups and began their breakfast. The meal consisted of what looked like bread and a topping of melted cheese. Kino said that it was very delicious, and then offered them some of the clay portable rations she had. They made an expression, and ended up eating only a little of what she gave them. After the meal, the men mounted their horses and left to shepherd the animals. The women were left in charge of cleaning up, mending clothing or the tents, and looking after the children. They occasionally took a break and smoked their pipes under the blue sky. While she was examining Hermes, Kino noticed that the children were looking from afar. If you want a closer look, go ahead, he doesn't bite. Only because I don't have any actual teeth. The children approached timidly. The youngest among them were mere toddlers, while the oldest were about 11 or 12. Since it was rare for them to see something like Hermes, some of them touched him with deep interest. Whoa, it's stiff! Amazing, it's an iron horse! Wow, an iron horse! His name is Hermes, Kino said. Hermes? That's a funny name! <laughs> no, 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 it's Hermes! Hermes! Not Hermes! It sounds weird when you say it like that. Hermes! 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 <laughs> no, no, I told you, it's Hermes! Not Er! Uh. Hermes! While the innocent children and the shameless Hermes let loose on each other, Kino noticed that a few of the children had small pipes in their mouths. But as she looked closer, she noticed that there wasn't any grass in them. What are those pipes? Do you all smoke too? Kino asked the oldest looking boy. No, we just have them around. Only the adults get to smoke them, because they work for the sake of everyone, and they get to smoke as a reward. In order to be recognized as an adult, boys have to learn how to ride the horses in order to flock the animals. Only then we'll be able to smoke for the first time. And what about you? Kino asked. I'm still training, the boy replied in a small voice. He then pulled out a stick from behind his waist and said, But if it's harvesting grass, I'm the best, the boy said proudly. But the girl behind him, who looked around twelve, said, Harvesting grass is the woman's work. A boy who can't ride is pretty lame. <laughs> the boy fell silent. The girl turned to Kino and said, oh, Can you believe I'm going to be his wife and bear his children? What? It's already decided? Of course. From the moment when I was born. That's why he has to really man up. He's just no good as he is right now. Oh, whatever. The boy responded. The girl ignored him and continued. It's quite sad, actually. Even I'm a better horse rider than he is. Kino made a smile. If that's the case, then can't you guys just exchange jobs once you're living together? The girl stared blankly at her for a moment. That's silly. I couldn't do that. Could I? Hey! No, you can't do that! Oh, that's so dumb! Well, too bad. I've already decided. I'm gonna go tell father now. <laughs> what? You can't! Can too! Hey, get back here! <laughs> Kino followed the pair with her eyes as they chased each other in high spirits. When she turned around, Hermes was still chatting with the kids surrounding him. No, no, Hermes, not Hermes! <laughs> Hermes, Hermes! <laughs> At noon, the men returned and everyone had their lunch and afternoon naps. After that, Kino was invited to try riding a horse. The clansman instructed Kino, who had never ridden a horse before. In the beginning, she was only able to make slow strides, but she soon became used to it, and before long was able to ride at fairly high speeds. Kino's brilliant riding skills was watched upon closely by the adult with admiration. The chief, with a smoking pipe in his mouth, curtly said, It's decided. The adults surrounding the chief nodded in silence. From a place slightly further away, a horseman watched this scene with his grey eyes.
That evening, after the unusual meal in the smoky tent, Kino, in front of her tent and sitting on Hermes, who was set on his center stand, looked up at the sky. Clouds were gathering over the western horizon, and the sunset was darkish. So, did they ever end up getting your name right, Hermes? No, all those children still think I'm called Hermes. Kino stifled a laugh. You know we leave tomorrow. You won't get another chance to correct them then. I suppose so, Hermes muttered. It looks like the weather will be bad tomorrow, Kino. You're right, but even so, we can only stay for three days. Roger that, said Hermes. You. The ashen-eyed man from the previous night had suddenly spoken up from behind. Hermes let out a yelp while Kino turned around at him with a glare. The man took a few steps toward them. He stood beside them and looked down at Kino and Hermes. Where are you from? He asked. Kino, without breaking her glare at the man, shook her head. Have you found a country you would like to stay in permanently? I'm still going to travel for a long time. The man made several nods and continued. You're able to accustom yourself to that destitution you call freedom? Kino said nothing. What's wrong? The man asked Kino, who was silently staring at him. This may be rude, but were you a traveler before? No. That's a lie, isn't it? Maybe, the man replied. As if seeking confirmation, Kino slowly asked, You weren't born with these people, were you? What about it? The man responded as he turned away. Kino followed his back with her eyes. When he could no longer be seen, Hermes asked, He's sharp. Just who in the world is he? Kino responded truthfully. I don't know. The next day, that is, the morning of the third day that Kino entered the clan, the sky was covered with low, heavy clouds. Though the sun had risen, the dimness of the sky hadn't changed. After breakfast, Kino informed the chief of our intention to leave that day. With a surprised face, he asked if anything had been done to upset her. Not at all. It's only because I have decided to stay for only three days in any single country. I am enormously grateful for your hospitality, though. The chief, who had been taken by surprise, immediately said, when the truth is, we already planned a welcoming celebration for you, and we'll be holding our first dinner party in a long time tonight. We'll be choosing a cow to be slaughtered for everyone to eat, so everyone's looking forward to it. Besides, the weather is bad. Can't you stay one night longer? I really thank you for taking so much trouble on my behalf, but... Upon seeing Kino's hesitation, the woman who had lent Kino her tent spoke. Chief, we can start the preparations immediately. If we do that, then we'll be able to hold the party a little past noon. That way, Mr. Kino could still take part. Oh, well how about that, Mr. Kino? Kino nodded in consent. The chief looked delighted and alerted everyone to the plan. And because of that, we'll be leaving a little after the feast. Kino told Hermes, whilst piling her luggage on him. Okay, have fun! After she had finished her preparations to depart, Kino left Hermes in the tent, put on her jacket, and turned toward the chief's tent. Soon after Kino left, Hermes complained to himself in the tent. Well, this is boring. Suddenly, the cuff of the opposite side of the entrance was raised, and a man's shadow slipped inside. Who's there? Kino's not here right now. Yeah. Oh, it's just the mister with the grey eyes, Hermes said somewhat nervously. The man grabbed Hermes's handlebars, removed him from his stand, and pushed him forward. Let's go. In the chief's tent, several long tables had been lined up with 30 people sitting all around it. 
As usual, everyone was inseparable from their pipes. And inside the tent was a wash of the stench of burning weed. At the center was a chunk of well-roasted beef. Kino was offered a seat near the center of the table. And with that, the party began. The man in charge cut up the meat into sections with a large kitchen knife. Salt and dried garlic were spread adequately across the cuts. When Kino asked where the children and the rest of the family were, the man next to her responded, We couldn't fit everyone inside this tent, though they're in a different one. Besides, there are those who have to guard the animals and look after the children. They're taking turns doing it, you see. It's been a long time since we've had meat after all. Also, it's our custom not to let the children participate. They must be really frustrated right now and wanting to become adults a lot sooner. The man whiffed a puff of smoke from his pipe and took a sip of liquid from a flask fashioned out of intestines. He offered Kino some, but when she learned that it was alcohol made from sheep's milk, she politely declined. Mr. Kino, how about some of this? A woman passed a wooden cup filled with tea to Kino. Kino thanked her and accepted it. Kino sniffed the tea and then asked, This has an interesting aroma. What is it? Huh? Um, oh well, you see it doesn't have a name. The woman was slightly taken aback, but she gave a smile and continued, Well, go ahead, have a taste. Kino stared at the tea for a few moments. I think the tea might be a bit too intense for me. I apologize, but I'll have to decline. She placed the cup on the table, and the man next to Kino looked at her suspiciously. Kino slowly stood up. Everyone, thank you for the feast, but it's about time for me to leave now. Is that so? Well, let me escort you out, said the woman, who was carrying the cup of tea. She led Kino toward the exit. Just as she was slowly turning her back, Kino suddenly twisted her body around. The woman brought down a cup, missing the back of Kino's head and sweeping her shoulder. Kino took a leap backwards as she kicked up the table behind her, scattering some of the food. Everyone in the tent stood up at once. With clubs in their hand, they looked at Kino with stiff expressions. The young men blocked the only exit, and the rest surrounded Kino. What is the meaning of this? Kino asked. The chief spoke from behind. Mr. Kino, won't you please just keep quiet and drink the tea? We don't want to give you a painful experience. We won't take your life. You'll just have to endure for a little while. Kino slowly turned around and questioned the chief. And what if I refuse? Without answering, the chief waved his hand, and the sound of clubs being gripped tightly was heard. Kino slowly pulled Cannon out of the holster on her right thigh. Everyone was flustered for a moment, but soon the chief took one step closer to Kino. <laughs> Are you planning on using that? You can't keep firing on that forever, can you? You may be able to bring down a few people, but after that, it's over. Yes, you're absolutely right, Kino said, and slowly returned Cannon to its holster. Several men approached Kino. She kicked up the fallen table and moved to the opposite side of the exit. She pulled out a kitchen knife still stuck in the meat and seized the nearest person, the chief. She grabbed his hair from behind with her left hand and poked his throat with the kitchen knife in her right. Nobody move! Kino cried sharply, and everyone's movements came to a complete halt. You bastard! The chief said in anguish. Don't worry, I won't take your life. You'll just have to endure for a little while. Ha! <laughs> this is futile. There's no way you can get out of here. Your motorad must have been destroyed by now. Then it's like that time again, Kino whispered absentmindedly. At the same time, she gripped the chief's hair more fiercely, pushing the knife against his throat. Amidst his distress, the chief shouted, Everyone! Even if I die, don't let her leave. Don't let her take a single step outside. How admirable. Kino tossed away the knife and let go of the chief's head at the same time. Before the knife fell, she pulled out cannon and fired three shots in succession. A thunderous roar echoed inside the tent. It was from the lower part of the central pillar. All three bullets hit their target, and the wooden pillar was hollowed out. While watching, the men sprung toward Kino. She gave the pole a violent kick and it toppled over, and the roof of the tent fell in a moment.
now crawled out from under the hem of the tent. Not a single soul could be seen under the dark sky. Only other similar looking tents lined up in silence. When she looked back, she saw the adults wriggling under the flattened tent. Oh, damn it! Look for her! Blood! Precious blood! Precious blood! Don't let her escape! Bring her back alive! Kino began to run to her own tent. However, when she passed through one side, a man leaped out. You're not going anywhere! Uh, uh, Kino uh, shot the man's foot and he tumbled over, uh, shrieking in pain. There he is! He's over there! Hearing the voices, Kino ran from the spot. She took a roundabout path to conceal herself among the nearby tents. At that moment, her mouth was covered suddenly from behind. Mm -hmm. Kino pushed Cannon at the chin of the person behind her and pulled the trigger. But no bullet came out. Kino's face froze. Don't say a word. I'm not going to hurt you. The force restraining her mouth loosened, allowing her to turn her neck. Ashen eyes stared back at her. His right hand gripped Cannon, with his thumb blocking the hammer. He slowly drew his hand away from Cannon and released Kino. Don't use your persuader. It'll give out your location. Kino looked at the man. Aren't you going to attack me? No, I won't. As he said this, another man's voice was heard. There he is! Ruha's got him! Three men with clubs approached. Use this and leave two of them to me. He handed Kino a similar club to theirs. The three men had rushed them unprepared and became confused when they were attacked by Kino and Raha. While Kino knocked down one of the men, Raha beat down the other two. Raha pulled a knife out from his waist and swiftly cut their windpipes. They writhed as blood gushed out from their throats, and they soon died. Then he did the same with the man that Kino took on. Why is it alright for you for me to escape? Raha slightly shook his head. I'm not doing this for you. I'm doing this for their sake. They've been living and suffering for a long time. What do you mean? Come over here. Raha pulled Kino into a nearby tent. Right as Kino entered, she heard a familiar voice. Kino, you're safe! Hermes? Inside the tent was Hermes, propped up with his kickstand and a pile of luggage. I convinced him to come with me earlier. If we're here, they won't find us for a while. Raha said, putting a pipe in his mouth. Thank you for doing this. Things turned out just as you had said. Yeah. It's just that it was too early for this to happen. As expected of you, Kino, on top of not drinking tea, you also were able to escape the tent. Roja said as he lit his pipe. He was using a match from Kino's luggage. I'm borrowing this, he said shortly. He then began to smoke, and seemed to find it relaxing. Can I ask you a question? Kino asked as she replaced Cannon's cylinder. Go ahead. Why are they trying to attack me? Furthermore, why are you helping us? Raha glanced at Kino. They have decided to take you into their clan. As for the reason, it is to bring in new blood from outside to this small tribe. They have been doing this for hundreds of years. They give a passing traveler a warm welcome, and once they have appraised the person's value to be high, they take them into their family. If the person's value is low, he would be killed. They were really pleased with you. Do you get it so far? Yes, but how are they planning on making me stay? It didn't look like they were bowing down and begging me. Raha held out a pipe in his right hand. You saw how all the adults were smoking these, right? There's a strong poison in the grass. Smoke it once and you become immediately addicted. It reaches the point where you can't live without it. If you stop taking it for half a day, your head begins to hurt. Three days and your hands start trembling. Five days and you start seeing hallucinations. If you hold out for ten days... You die from madness, sobbing over yourself. The tea you refused was laced with the extract from this grass. And what would have happened if I drank it? You would lose consciousness right there and then, bedridden and moaning non-stop for days on end. During that time, Hermes would be taken apart and scattered under the ground, and the clan would relocate. I don't want to think about it, said Hermes. You would be smoked even through your moans so that you would be perfectly addicted once you woke up. You wouldn't be able to live at all without us. The grass doesn't grow anywhere else other than this field, and the only time it can be harvested is during the short period in autumn. You can either spend your life doing compulsory duties, 
or you can die with withdrawal symptoms. It's your choice either way. I see. I understand very well now. Kino nodded several times, and then asked, When did you... Five years ago. I was careless. How has it been? Ruha gave a bitter smile, and put some more glass into his pipe. When I first woke up, I wondered what on earth had happened. I spat curses out, and to make matters worse, the negative response from the poison was gut-wrenching. I was certain I was going to die. Ruha lit his pipe and put it back in his mouth, which had curled into a smile. But the young woman who was attending me, well, she was a younger woman back then, but anyway, she said to me, It's no good if you die. You can't die. She said this to me again and again, through a sea of tears. If you live, good things will surely happen. <sighs> You're right. <sighs> so... I continued to live here. I memorized my duties quickly, and I was accepted by everyone. And then, I became married to that woman. Well, it was actually decided from the moment we had been evaluated together. Are you happy? Asked Hermes. You could say that, I guess. It was perhaps the happiest time of my life. What happened to your wife? Last year, around this time. She was killed. Why? Ruha breathed a puff of smoke. <sighs> Voices could be heard from outside the tent. He's not in here either! Someone shouted as they passed by. It was because she couldn't bear children. She tried to give birth, but it ended up being a miscarriage. And she became unable to bear another child for the rest of her life. If a woman can't produce children, then she is of no value. Such people are a waste of precious food and grass. A waste that they could not tolerate. Not here. And so it was immediately decided at the order of the chief that she had to die. She accepted that, was killed, and then buried. As to where, I no longer know. What were you doing all that time, mister? Hermes asked. In the end... I told her the exact same thing she first said to me. Kino and Hermes remain silent. And that's how it is. Roha took one last puff of smoke, tossed the ashes, and put away the pipe. It's about time, I think. About time for what? Kino asked. Roha didn't answer, though, and moved slightly to the side of the tent's entrance. A clansman poked his head inside of the tent and saw Kino. There he is! He's been in here! The man yelled, and in the next moment, great splashes of blood swelled forth from his throat. Roar went over to the man's corpse and kicked it outside. Well, let's go outside. Kino unfastened Hermes' kickstand and slowly pushed him along. Outside, all of the adults had the tent surrounded. When they saw Kino and Hura step outside the tent, a communication spread across the crowd. The sky was darker than it had ever previously been. What's going on here? The chief asked was glaring at them. There's nothing to be said about it. Hand over the prisoner and I'll consider your punishment later. Hura pulled out his pipe, then leisurely and carefully stuffed it with grass. Don't bother. Your time is over. What nonsense! The irritated family head shouted. He issued orders for a few men holding long rods. Attack them at once! Don't let them escape! I don't care if you have to give them a few injuries! Ruar struck a match and slowly transferred the flame to the pipe. A muffled explosion echoed in the settlement. The adults whirled around and a panicked scream emanated from one who found its origin. What? From a small tent, conspicuous amount of smoke was rising from a hole in the roof. I told you, if you don't do something fast, everything is going to burn up. Ruha said whilst taking a smoke. Everyone's faces became pale. The grass fire! 
They rushed toward the burning tent as if they'd completely forgotten about Kino and Ruha. The smoke from the tent began to rise with increased vigor, and the flames could be seen flickering from inside. Out the fire! Water! Ruha, Kino, and Hermes watched on from behind as the people screamed madly. They hit the fire with their clubs and whacked it with their clothes, but their desperate attempts to put out the fire were entirely ineffective. The fire, unrestrained, just grew more furious. That was the tent where all the grass that was saved up from last year was stored. I rigged it earlier. I asked Hermes if I could use a little bit of oil and gunpowder. Without the grass, everyone's got ten days to live, said Ruha. Kino turned to face him. Including me. Ruha breathed a puff of smoke. The fire grew more and more, and the flame shined on the figures of the people surrounding it. One man moved closer to the fire, resolving to salvage some of the grass. The sleeves of his coat and his hair caught fire, and soon his whole body leapt up in flames. The man danced engulfed in fire. No one helped him, and he eventually danced his last and fell down. Then there were several more bodies who caught fire. The faces of numerous people, desperately trying to put out the fire, turned a ghastly pale as they collapsed from suffocation. As people were tossed away or stepped on, the futile fire dousing operation continued. The roof of the tent fell, and as the flames engulfed the entirety of the grass, the smoke grew more temptuous. Kino gazed at the depressing situation before her as she watched person after person collapse. Others desperately breathed in all the smoke they could, thrusting their faces into the deep fumes. White foam began to appear from their mouths as they staggered, making strange shrieking before they fainted. Finally, the tent and the grass had burned down entirely. Around the burned wreckage, the motionless bodies of several people tumbled about. The people who could still move ended themselves. Suddenly, a man grabbed the neck of a nearby woman and pinned her to the ground, choking her to death. <laughs> As the sound of heads splitting open could be heard, the number of motionless people increased. One man tottered toward Kino. Both of his hands had been turned into charcoal. But the man laughed and closed his hollow eyes. Ruha slashed his throat in a moment. And then, Ruha moved closer to the charred ruin, putting other people out of their misery. The people who had sunk down to the floor, those who were weeping, laughing, or embracing each other, those which foamed from the mouth, those who were bludgeoned to death, and those who were burned halfway through. The last remaining person, the one once called the chief, spoke to Ruha. You... <coughs> what are you? <coughs> one year ago, if you hadn't have done that, Maybe there would have been another way. The man with the blood-stained knife looked back at him with his ashen eyes. The chief held his head in his hands and muttered as he tore out his hair. It's... it's the end. It's the end of everything. Ruha shook his head sideways. No, not everything. Goodbye, chief. <laughs> With the knife remaining in the neck of the family head, Rua turned around. Kino and Hermes watched on as he came over to them. You can go now. Where will you go? Maybe somehow a country is a cure to this poison. If you're going to die by just staying here, why not try what little possibility there is? The man looked at Kino and muttered, Maybe there would be a chance. Then he clearly said, But I'm staying here. Why? There's nobody here anymore. Ruha smiled. Have you forgotten? <laughs> the children. Not everything has ended. I'll explain to them what the adults did, what they were smoking, and why I did this. 
I'll also teach them how they can live on their own. Until I die of that madness, I'll have to show them that death as well. If I can do that, they should be able to use the remaining animals and survive. They should be able to make a new future, one without smoke. That is why I'm staying here. I understand. Kino gave a small nod, and then she asked, Where are you from? If it's a place I pass by... Ruar shook his head. It would be better if you didn't do something like that. In the country where I was born, I was a murderer. Kino stayed silent. What did you do? Since this is the end, why not tell us? Hermie said, and Ruar gave a sad smile. The end, huh? I was a soldier then. Ever since I was a little kid, I received special training. When war came, I assassinated a lot of enemies. I thought I had killed for my country's sake. For everyone's sake. But after the war, I just became a nuisance. For a country that had won a fight in the name of justice, it couldn't be said publicly that an assassin took lives in its place. As a broken down, murderous demon whose usefulness had expired, I was expelled from the country. I didn't want to go on a journey or anything like that. I just wanted to spend my whole life in the place where I was born. I wanted to build my family and live a normal life there. When I came upon these people, I wondered if I could start from scratch. I see. Thank you. Don't mention it, replied Ra. Kino remained silent putting on her coat, her hat, and her goggles on. Just as she was about to start Hermes' engine, Rua suddenly spoke. You look a lot like her. Pardon? Earlier, you asked me why I helped you, right? It's because you looked like her. Not your face, but your eyes. Your eyes were just like hers. Rua slowly narrowed his ashen eyes. By any chance, if I was taken into the family... Would I have become your wife? That's right. This is goodbye. I was lucky that I met you. Ruha turned his back to Kino. I won't forget how you saved me. The man didn't turn back. He simply and lightly waved his hand. The children were shuddering in one tent. Finally, the entrance opened, and an ashen-dyed man entered. He said that he had something to tell them, something that was very important, something he wanted all of them to hear. The children slowly gathered around the man in a circle. The man surveyed each of the children, and then opened his mouth. But in that moment, a knife was stabbed into his throat. <coughs> And not a sound came out of it. I saw you. You killed everyone. The man tried to say something, desperately trying to move his mouth. But no voice came out, and he finally died. The children went outside the tent, and then they cried. <laughs> When they grew tired of crying, someone spoke up. From now on, we have to live on our own. We have to do everything the adults did. Everyone nodded. In the tent of the family chief, the children searched for anything useful. Someone found a bag with lots of strange things in it, and everyone looked over. Nobody recognized it, but it was the grass that the chief had stored up in use for times of emergency. There was a considerable quantity of the grass. Someone realized that they must be what all the adults were smoking, and suggested that they smoke it as well. But that's only for adults. Someone said, but then someone else replied, We are the only adults now, and so these are our rewards. This view became accepted, and every one of them put a pipe inside their mouth and began to smoke. At first, it gave some of them an awful sensation, and they found it sickening. But, in order to become an adult, they endured. 